Hello, welcome back. Today we are looking at Chapter 7, Section 2, The Constitutional Convention. Uh, and this follows along with pages 206 to 210 in your textbook. So if you want to open that textbook now and follow along, there are some things I'm going to point out and hit a little bit harder than the textbook does, and vice versa. There's some things in the textbook that will be explained a little bit more in detail than what we'll be discussing in today's lesson. Um, speaking of today's lesson, our essential question for today is how did delegates from different states create a constitution that could be agreed on by all states? Now you can also see I've already done an audio recording of this lesson so if you prefer to do that you can just hit stop on this video and use just the audio recordings or you can just read through it on your own that is up to you I won't take offense. Alright so let's get our key terms for today uh, we'll be talking about the Constitutional Convention, the Virginia Plan, the New Jersey Plan, uh, the word compromise in its of itself, the Great Compromise, and the Three-Fifths Compromise. So I'm going to talk a lot about compromise today, but what is compromise? Well, well, if you believe this picture, then compromise means uh, let's agree to respect each other's views no matter how wrong yours may be. So what does it mean to compromise? Well, if you believe this picture, it involves agreeing to respect a view even if you think it to be wrong. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's supposed to be funny, it's supposed to be humorous, but there is an element of truth in it. How can two people with totally different views reach an agreement if neither one wants to change his mind. Well, the idea behind compromise is for each side to give up a little in order to best ben benefit everyone that's involved. And our first video is going to talk about using problem solving to resolve a conflict. And the video is going to give you a glimpse into negotiations and compromise, but more importantly than that, uh, I want you to pay special attention to the awesome early 90s fashions that are being represented in this video. Uh, it's pretty awesome. And after that's over, we'll pick back up with what we're going to be discussing. Besides confrontation, opinion adjustment, and avoidance, there's another way people can handle their conflicts. A problem-solving approach. One way to use problem-solving is to work out a compromise. How long are you guys going to be using the court? I don't know, guys. About 15 minutes before we stop for lunch. But, you know, we were here first, so if you're going to play here, well, you got to give it back to us when we return. So how long are you going to be gone? I don't know. Half hour? Could you make it a few minutes longer, say... 45 minutes? Yeah. Uh, what do you say, guys? Yeah. All right, fine. You got your 45 minutes. All right, well. In a compromise, each party gets something, and each gives up something. In this instance, one group gets to use the court a little longer than the other wanted. But in return, it has agreed to leave when the first group returns. Hey, guys. No. Compromises work as long as what's given up isn't very important to the person or persons who have surrendered it. Obviously, this group's having to leave the court after 45 minutes isn't that important to them. If you look at the business world or at international politics, you'll see that leaders often try to fashion compromises. And sometimes those compromises do work, just like they do in daily situations on school basketball courts. They work when neither side feels that it has given up too much. But schoolyard, business, and diplomatic compromises can, and sometimes do, fail. Because one side, or both sides, feel it's not been dealt an even hand. The delegates to the convention. The delegates to the convention. Now that video was, that video was fun, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I agree. The, it looked awesome. So, Pictured here is Independence Hall as it looked in 1776, and for those of you that either live in Philadelphia or have ever been to Philadelphia, uh, you know that it looks pretty much the same today. So, it's 
good to know that some things change and some things stay the same. All right, but back to the history part. So May of 1787, delegates were sent from all of the states except for Rhode Island. So we have representation from 12 of the 13 states all converge on Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and these 55 delegates were varied in their ages and experience levels, and they all had their own ideas for how to revise the Articles of Confederation, but they shared a common goal of trying to repair the federal government of the United States. And it's also important to note that they met in May of 1787, but they worked through the summer and they kept the windows closed despite an extremely warm summer in Philadelphia so that they could freely debate ideas without pressures from people passing. And among the delegates was this uh, fine young man, Mr. James Madison of Virginia. And when he came to the convention, he actually prepared by reading books on history, politics, and commerce, and even though he was shy, he, he was, he was a very, very shy dude, uh, his <clears throat> research and views on the structure of a democratic government helped to influence the other delegates, and today he's often referred to as the father of the Constitution. and. Our next video is going to look at some of the ideas that were being thrown around in this, uh, in this conven constitutional convention by some of these different gentlemen. State Senator Samuel Adams, co-author of the Riot Act. Rebellion against the king may be pardoned or lightly punished, but the man who dares to rebel against the laws of a republic ought to suffer death. General Henry Knox, Secretary of War. The maxim that all power is derived from the people, that all government is influenced by them, is perverted by a certain proportion of the people. Thomas Jefferson, speaking more philosophically and from a safe distance in Europe, disagrees. A little rebellion now and then is a good thing. It is a medicine necessary for the sound health of government. God forbid that we should ever be 20 years without such a rebellion. But Jefferson is distinctly in the minority. There can be no stronger evidence of the want of energy in our governments than these disorders. Let us have a government by which our lives, liberty, and property will be served. Or let us know the worst at once. George Washington, former commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, presides over a convention in Philadelphia that will determine the future course of American government. The delegates who represent 12 different quarreling states, disagree enormously over the means and the end of government. But Shays' Rebellion, the fiercest outbreak of discontent in the new nation, is one reason they agree this convention is a necessary action. James Madison, delegate from Virginia, points to Massachusetts in today's debate over whether there should be a national standing army. No state, gentlemen, no state has the right to raise troops in time of peace without the consent of Congress. It hasn't Massachusetts, the most powerful member of the Union, already raised an army. And isn't she now raising more and more soldiers without even bothering to notify Congress? Elbridge Gerry, who has experienced the rebellion in his native Massachusetts, takes issue. You would create United States troops and turn them loose on any one of the states without its consent? I'm against it, gentlemen. The states are the best judges of when they need help. More blood would have been spilled in the Massachusetts Rebellion if Congress had meddled in it. The rebellion is a focal point of today's debate, turning some of the delegates against a plan proposed by New Jersey, which seems too favorable to state sovereignty. And what if the rebels in Massachusetts had put a king in power? a dictator, a Caesar, or a Cromwell. What next? What becomes of the independence of New Hampshire, or Rhode Island, or Connecticut, or New York? Gentlemen, ask yourselves honestly whether the New Jersey plan meets the needs of the United States 
as well as the individual states. The rebellion in Massachusetts is a warning, gentlemen. Two rival plans and a compromise. Now, the delegates did not get very far into their debates before they realized that they weren't going to simply be able to revise the Articles of Confederation. Uh, it was going to take a lot more than that. Uh, really, they were just going to have to throw that out and start from scratch to build the federal government from the ground up. And the major disagreements came primarily from how the government should be set up. And the reason I'm showing you these pictures is because really there were two rival plans that were kind of coming to the forefront. and. I can't talk about rivalries without uh, bringing up the Penguins and the Flyers, because I just can't. So let's look in a little bit more detail at these two plans. The first plan was proposed by this man, Mr. Edmund Randolph, as well as James Madison. Both of these men are from Virginia, so this is known as the Virginia Plan. The Virginia Plan called for a very strong national government with three branches. The legislative branch, which would pass the laws, the executive branch, which would carry out the laws, and then the judicial branch, which is a system of courts to, de to determine if the laws were fair. And in the Virginia Plan, the legislature would consist of two houses, an upper and a lower house, but the representation would be based on population. So in these two houses, uh, larger states would have more representation, smaller states would have less uh, representation. So the Virginia plan, what you need to know about it is it really favored the larger states. So if on one side you have the Virginia plan, on the opposite side you have the New Jersey plan. Now. It was proposed by this man, Mr. William Patterson of New Jersey, and it also called for three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial, but in the New Jersey plan, the legislature only had one house, and each state would get one vote regardless of population, so this allowed small states to have an equal voice as the large, larger states, and it really was favorable to the smaller states. So, Virginia plan favored large states, New Jersey plan favored small states, and something's gotta change. So, which brings us to the Great Compromise, also known as the Connecticut Compromise, because it was proposed by a gentleman from Connecticut. So, back and forth, the delegates debated for a long time, and they were really stuck on this point of representation in the legislature. So they couldn't, it seemed like an agreement could not be reached until Roger Sherman of Connecticut steps in and works out a compromise that would benefit both the small and the larger states, and his plan would call for a two-house legislature. The lower house, which will be known as the House of Representatives, uh, in this house, representation would be based on a popular vote and the seats would be based on population. So this would appeal to the larger states. The larger the state, the more representation. And in the upper house of the legislature, known as the Senate, uh, this would representation each state would get two senators, and originally this was chosen by the state legislatures. It wasn't until much later on that it was also elected by popular vote. But having the Senate as the upper house appealed to the smaller states. So one house appealed to the larger states because representation was based on population, and then the upper house appealed to the smaller states because representation was the same across the board, no matter how large or small your state is. So Sherman's plan was approved by a very narrow margin on July 16th, 1787, and has come to be known as the Great Compromise, or the Connecticut Compromise. Those two terms are 
kind of interchangeable. And it's known as the Great Compromise because each side gave up a li some of its demands in order to achieve unity. And our next two videos, they're back to back, they're ver and they're very short, but they'll look at the New Jersey plan, the Virginia plan, and then the Great Compromise that brought both plans together. And then we'll pick up with another compromise. The delegates adopted three rules. Each state got one vote. If seven states agreed, a rule passed. The meetings were to be secret. This helped ensure that the delegates would not be criticized or pressured from outsiders. A journal of the meetings was not published until 1819. Two plans were debated. The New Jersey plan, favored by small states, called for some amendments to the Articles of Confederation. The Virginia plan, favored by large states, involved writing a whole new constitution. At first, the delegates who gathered in Philadelphia over 200 years ago disagreed about how to organize the legislative branch. One delegate, James Madison of Virginia, proposed that Congress consist of representatives from each state and that the number of a state's representatives be based on its population. Under Madison's proposal, states with a lot of people, like Pennsylvania, would have more representatives than states with fewer people, like Georgia. The smaller states, however, worried that with this system, they would have too little power. William Patterson, a delegate from New Jersey, proposed instead that all states have the same number of representatives, no matter what their populations. But delegates from the larger states felt Patterson's plan would be unfair to them. For a while, this problem deadlocked the convention. But finally, the delegates reached what has been called the Great Compromise. They agreed that Congress would consist of not one, but two different legislative bodies or houses. Today, this compromise is still in effect. In one house of Congress, the Senate, each state has the same number of representatives, two. This means that California, the largest state with a population of over 33 million, has the same number of senators as Wyoming, with a population of less than 500,000. However, in the other House of Congress, the House of Representatives, the number of representatives for each state is based on population. Today, the total number of representatives is 435, but each state's share of this total is determined by how many people it has. California, for example, has 53 representatives, while Wyoming has only one. Now, it wasn't just the large and small states that were disagreeing at this time. There was also a disagreement between, it was, and a division that was really starting between the northern and southern states, and that was primarily over slavery. And it, two issues were really coming to the forefront re with regards to slavery. First, would slaves count towards the population of that state? And secondly, would the slave trade even continue? Now, Southerners, now, Southerners wanted slaves to be included in the population count, even though they didn't have any of the rights that were guaranteed to American citizens. And Northern states argued that since slaves couldn't vote, they shouldn't be counted towards a state's uh, population and shouldn't be counted towards that representation. Now, if Southerners won and slaves were counted, then they would have more seats and more representation in the House of Representatives. But if northern states won and slaves were not counted at all, then the northern states would gain control of the House of Representatives. So back and forth and back and forth they went until an agreement was finally reached known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. And we're looking at a kind of looking at the Three-Fifths Compromise right here. And it said that only th three-fifths of the slave population would count towards a state's representation. This way, southern states would get some credit for the slave population without totally overwhelming northern states. 
and our next video is going to go into this in a little bit more detail some of the the fighting that was going back and forth and ultimately the compromise of the Another important issue separating the North and South was slavery and its expansion into the newly created states and territories. The issue of slavery was not a problem peculiar to the Civil War era. It was a contested issue even as our country's founders were drawing up the Constitution for our new nation in 1787. Legislators argued over whether slaves should be counted as part of the state's population in determining how many representatives a state should have in Congress. The lawmakers finally decided that a slave would represent three-fifths of a person. This is called the Three-Fifths Compromise. Now when we started this section, I said that there were two main disagreements that were coming to the forefront between the northern and southern states. The first we just looked at, which was whether or not slaves would be counted towards a state's population, and that was kind of solved with the Three-Fifths Compromise. The second major disagreement arose over whether or not to even continue the slave trade. By 1787, some of the northern states had completely outlawed slavery, but the southern states for the most part were very dependent on slavery because it was a very large part of their economy. Now in the end, northern states argued that Congress and, and they agreed that Congress could not outlaw slavery for 20 years, nor could any state prevent fugitive slaves from being returned to their owners. And what we're looking at is an actual poster from the, stra uh, the slave trade. So what does this mean in, in realistic terms? Well, basically what they agreed on was that they wouldn't make any decision on outlawing or keeping the slave trade going for another 20 years and that was kind of in hopes that the slave trade would completely completely die off it had already died off a lot in the north and a lot of a lot of people were hoping it would just kinda of like die on its own so instead of saying we're gonna make a decision now it's almost like they said you know who you know who can make a better decision on this future us so they just kind of postponed a major decision for 20 years and that's but it's important to note that this issue of should slavery continue in the states was really like there's already this division that's that's it had been been going but it's even it's getting even more divisive at this point and this is 1787 so we've got a long way to go which brings us to the signing of the U.S. Constitution on September 17th, 1787. Actually, we just celebrated Constitution Day not too long ago. 17, 1787, September 17th, the Constitution was ready to be signed, and all but three of the delegates uh, signed it. And once it was signed, it was sent off to the states for ratification. And once nine of the 13 states approved it, the Constitution would take effect. And it's important to note that the Constitution did not address all of the issues that were pressing that day. But what it did do was it outlined a strong central government with power balanced between the three branches. And this strong central government really scared some of the people who feared that fear, they feared too much power being placed in the hands of a few but honestly what was the alternative the country had tried existing as 13 independent separate little entities and it was very young but it was on the almost on the brink of failure so what this new constitution really did was it didn't fix every problem immediately but it created a stronger central government that could deal with problems in the future and at this point the US really took a step towards becoming a unified country and not just a loose association of states and next I w I'm going to show you the order in which 
the Constitution was ratified. ratification of the Constitution. The authors and signatories of the Constitution set their names to the document in affirmation of their agreement. These were the greatest political minds of their day, and the document they had created is a marvel of democracy in action. Proof of its validity is the fact that within a year, 11 of the 13 original states had approved it, making it the supreme law of the land. In 1789, George Washington became our first president, and all 13 states had ratified the Constitution by 1790. Yet there were some, such as anti-federalist patriots like Thomas Jefferson, who feared the Constitution didn't go far enough to protect individual rights. Their concerns led to the Bill of Rights. I think sometimes we tend to make the document or we tend to make the Constitution too sacred instead of realizing that it was created by men and women who were fallible, just as we are. The real intent of the Constitution was as a preventative document, if you will. And it's important to keep that in mind because that's why we have a separation of powers, to prevent too much power from getting into the hands of a person who would misuse it rather than having too much power from getting into the hands of a person who could use it for good. It's a pretty complex document. Uh, there's a wonderful story of a, a man who teaches, he no longer teaches constitutional law at Yale, and taught it for years, uh, years and years. And about this time he's about eight years old, and someone asks him, what does the Constitution mean? And he actually looks at this person. This is a man who spent 50 years of his life easy interpreting it and understanding it and studying it and writing about it and thinking about it. And his answer was, you know, I'm just starting to really understand what the Constitution really means. Which brings us to today's assignment. Now, there is no written assignment for today's lesson, but you will be responsible for this information on the Chapter 7, Section 1 and 2 quiz. So I suggest that you either go back and read through chapters or chapter 7, section 1 and 2 in the text or the lesson, or go back and review your notes, and once you're ready, uh, move on to the short quiz. And just as a, a little reminder, like all quizzes, uh, you can use your book as a reference, but I prefer that you not think of this as an open book quiz. You can use it as a reference because if we were in a traditional classroom, you could just raise your hand and say, Mr. Hubner, I don't understand number three. I'm on the other side of a computer, so I can't do that very easily. So if you do have a question and you can't reach me either through Moodle message or on the phone, you can use your book to reference back to see, oh yeah, this, this might be what he's looking for. All right. Um, and well, that's about it for today, so I'm going to leave you with one of my personal favorite videos, uh, the Schoolhouse Rock song, The Preamble. Enjoy, and have a great rest of your day. about the USA? Do you know about the government? Can you tell me about the Constitution? Hey, learn about the USA. In 1787, I'm told our founding fathers did agree to write a list of principles for keeping people free. The USA was just starting out a whole brand new country And so our people spelled it out, the things that we should be
and they put those principles down on paper and called it the Constitution. And it's been helping us run our country ever since then. The first part of the Constitution is called the Preamble and tells what those founding fathers set out to do. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. common defense, promote the general welfare at hand, secure the blessings of liberty, to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. In 1787, I'm told, our founding fathers all sat down and wrote a list of principles that's known the world around. The USA was just starting out a whole brand new country, and so our people spelled it out. They wanted a land of liberty, and the preamble goes like this. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. Provide for the country. 